Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Goodison Park, my home, as we recall the magical memories of um, Everton's uh, long-time home ahead of the, the stadium move and I'm delighted to have uh, Michael Ball here with us today, regular Echo um, columnist, and, but after speaking to some players from um, back in the 80s, I'm just glad to have somebody of the uh, same age as myself as Michael on uh, this week. Um, I'm the older party, I think, by about a, a month or something <laughs> like that, but we're uh, I was uh, grappling with Freshers Week at uh, university in September 97. Uh, Michael was grappling with um, Patrick Vieira and Dennis Bergkamp <laughs> in the Premier League uh, as he was facing Arsenal. But uh, good to see you, Michael. Great to you come in and speak to us today. Yeah, no problem, Chris. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, I mean lifelong Evertonian, of of course. But uh, what were your first, like your earliest football memories or the, the first thing you can remember about Everton or going to Goodson Park? Well... I'd like someone to look into this, to be yeah. honest. I was talking to my parents not so long ago. I was born in Lowell Street, which is four or five streets away from Goodison. Yeah. Um, and obviously in my nappies, I can't really remember much of that time. But then my dad was in the pub game um, and he, he owned and ran the Tramways pub, okay. which is not there anymore, but it's only a few streets away off yeah. County Road. And he used to always look at the window. My dad always sneak off to the match uh, with his uncles. My dad's one yeah. of nine, right. the eldest, so they all march on, uh, leave me mum with the children. And yeah. I'll be looking out of the window, seeing all the fans going towards Goodison. And yeah. I was hooked from then. I yeah. wanted to see where they're going and what they're doing. And yeah. um, maybe probably when I was around about four or five, yeah. um, my mum forced him to take me to the games and yeah. give him a bit, of a, a bit of respite. And for some reason, in the back of my mind, and maybe because of the programme I still got, was a, I think it might be Luton, but I'm not 100% sure. Right, back, you're not too sure your first game. Yeah, yeah and I... I um, so I used to go at the odd game round yeah. about four or five, but I think maybe when the weather was a bit better. And I just loved yeah. like just walking up from, from the pub and yeah. with all the fans and getting the odd twenty P or fifty P off my uncles to go to Chiffy and stuff yeah. like that. And and it was just a part of being a on my, my dad's side of the family, all massive blues. And yeah. um when I got a little bit old enough we, we ended up going the the main stand or the uh, the family enclosure a little bit. Um a few of them were members of the the Five Under Club, which I think yeah. might be the Alex Young now, I'm not too okay. sure. Um, so I used to go in there and cause havoc, really, with the other children that were yeah. there because of half time, or you know, we were spoiled, weren't we? You know, the, yeah. the team are fantastic, and yeah. um, they had the dance floor, the dance floor turned into a football pitch between me and the, the, the little lads yeah. there, and, and play football with a paper cup and uh, running out to get the pink echo yeah. after, afterwards. I, I had yeah. my jobs to do, <laughs> um, but yeah, that was just hooked from first time. I, I witnessed all the fans marching up to Goodison Park yeah. and to be a part of that as a fan was brilliant. Yeah, I'm actually they look like really big as well when you're that age. I remember Mike going mm-hmm. the game the first time, how, how big the main stand actually seemed. It must have been quite the size. Yeah, it was just impressive. Yeah. You know, I just loved it. And obviously the team are brilliant. And yeah. you know, all, all the lads in the 80s, we, we had a successful time. And you, you, were, you were just spoiled. Just when you win the league, you're singing outside the Wimslow. My, my, pair, my dad would go to Wimslow, my mum would pick us up afterwards and we're yeah. singing songs and... That the, the players would be sticking their heads out of the windows and just yeah. get a bit of a cheer and yeah, those good great memories of, of my childhood going to the game. Yeah, so it was interesting when you when you got playing with Taunton before we we went on air before actually you described it as a few years over on the dark side mm-hmm. when you're actually training with Liverpool as a youngster before you came to Everton. Yeah, when we moved to um, me, me dad come out to the pub game, we moved to Formby and I got to that age where I was trying to find new friends from school and you, you start playing football in the park and um, I think my dad. Sort of few, uh, <laughs> a few, a few little hints here and there to get me get me in the team when I shouldn't yeah. have been in the team. Said I was seven when I wasn't, and <laughs> we joined the local team. And fortunately for me, there was a um, good players in that in that setup. Yeah. John Newby was that. Um, there was Barry McCauley, whose father was Hugh McCauley, yeah. um, top coach at Liverpool under Stephen Highway and Dave Shannon. And uh, because of my performance just in and around the place, he invited me in to go to Melwood once a week and. Yeah. Uh, moved into Litherland uh, High School um, later on as their centre of excellence, and mm-hmm. that was a uh, part of sort of learning the learning the trade really of learning yeah. how to play football with you know, good co- good quality players and around yourself. At only about an hour a week, but it was uh, different than it is nowadays. Where yeah. you know the only kit I had and turn up at Mel was an Everton kit, so yeah. you know, there was a lot of stick, a lot of banter going on. But they loved it. I loved yeah. it. I made sure it was it was ready for every time I went on the Tuesday and. Yeah. Highway, Shannon and, and uh, Hugh would give me a bit of stick for it, but they were fantastic coaches and yeah. um, all about technique and how to pass. And 
you know, I can still spot players who have who, been coached under them, how they pass a ball, how they receive a ball. Right. It, it's, it does stand out to me. And they, they were fantastic, but I was still waiting for the call. And when that come, it was there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was much wanted. Yeah. And uh, like when you, when, when you came to, to Everton, you were saying you weren't actually at Everton all the time because I don't know if some of the, the younger viewers might not be aware of this, but the old National um, School of Excellence down at Lillashaw, you, you were down there. How did that actually work then in terms of what you were doing? Yeah, so y- y- your club, well, it was the club at the time was Liverpool, put yeah. you forward to the, um, just to go for trials. I think just you know, whatever, there's thousands of kids around the country. You get to, uh, whittled down from north to south. You go to Keel University and then... It, it gets down to the, the final 16 and yeah. you get a chance to, to do a bit of a scholarship in a, in a school, uh, in a national school centre for two years. So from age 14 to 16. So yeah. um have a sign for Everton was a, um, quite a funny story yeah. really because obviously Ray Hall was head of the academy. Yeah. Um, finally the, the call came and then he said, Howard Kendall wants to meet you in, in a fancy restaurant uh, where Howard lived and yeah. you had to wear a suit. I didn't have a suit to my name. I had to borrow oh. somebody's suit a couple of sizes too big for yeah. me just to get into the place. And it was just an honour just to meet Howard, yeah. you know, just to meet Howard and Ray Hall um, and I had opportunities. I went to try out Man United, uh, Oldham, and they, they, that's when it sort of gets a little bit serious right yeah. after 13, 14, age for schoolboys uh, forms. And Howard... You know, just does, does what Howard does, and asked me the the question: Do you want to yeah. play for us, son or lad? And I said yes, and then yeah. marched me off to the other side of the restaurant while my parents and <laughs> Rayol and Howard have a a discussion about all topics. I think yeah. my dad didn't hold back on a few signings and a, yeah. Yeah, a few things here and there. And they yeah. had a nice little giggle. I was on my own for a couple of hours. Um, my lay enjoyed themselves and every so often my dad would go to the toilet and give me a wink. So I didn't know what <laughs> wow. they were talking about, but I knew it was positive and. Yeah. Um, waited for my parents were asleep and had a little nose of what happened and yeah. I've, I've signed for Everton Football Club which was, which was my dream come true and um, not long after that then uh, when you're 14 in the September I went to I was off to Lillishaw uh, yeah. for two years so I didn't really get an opportunity to sort of play or train many times with the, the youth lads uh, it was only half terms uh, Easter holidays so like that you come back home and if there was a game, an opportunity to play for the A team or the B team back then, yeah. uh, you'd be a part of it to get to know your, your new teammates and um, that's going to be in the future. And I think one of my first games for Everton was at Melwood against yeah. all my old teammates, where, which was you know Michael Owen, Gerard, and Kumas. Um, it was a very strong side, and you know we won well. So I had a big smile on my face <laughs> knowing I made the right decision. Definitely, um, but. Um, your, your first team debut, that was actually uh, Dave Watson, wasn't it, when he was caretaker manager, just after Joe Ro- Royal had gone, and uh, right saying he came on, was it Tottenham Hotspur, was it? It was, yeah. yeah, it was, I don't know whether it was the uh, impatience of, of myself, um, Joe and Willie Donaghy, um, and, but Jimmy Gabriel was brilliant yeah. to me. Uh, when I come back from school after the show, 16, YTS, I was only YTS for, for three months, so it was only three months of cleaning the boot room and yeah. cleaning the, the the muds and stuff like that. And then at 17 in the October, I, I turned professional. But Jimmy Gabriel, uh, seeing aside that he, he wanted to, me to be involved in the reserves a lot more. Yeah. So through that pre-season, I was involved. The reserves wasn't like as it is today. It was only probably six or seven players. And it was filled in with the, the lads who never played for the first team yeah. and then the rest of the youngsters. And probably playing left side had probably helped me to get that opportunity. And yeah. it was just the shock of I was quite strong for my own age and yeah. being playing a year above and two years above myself I could hold my own but then when you're in the man's world it was a dif- yeah. different kettle of fish you had yeah. to use your brain a lot more and Jimmy seen, seen something in me and he used to pull me to one side and spend a lot of time with me um, and and work on my game work what I needed to do uh, short games and you're, but I'm playing with like Limpard and yeah. you know, Ken Charles has been there <laughs> for a little bit and Finney Zanways and Tony Grants and these are footballers, you know, yeah. and you very difficult. I was I used to hold my own against a lot of players to I can win a tackle, I can be aggressive, but yeah. um they were very quick, very, yeah. very sharp, one or two touch in trade and so it was a a, bit, <laughs> a steep learning curve straight yeah. away from the off, but it was that was down to Jimmy pushing yeah. me, give me that opportunity and, and then Joe and, and, and Willie, um when there was opportunities where Say Andy Hinchcliffe or other first team players were were injured or having a rest yeah. day. I'll join with the first team, and again the level jumped up again of the yeah. the sharpness. So it was great to be a part of it. Um, I travelled a few times with with Joe Royal, and you know, sad to see him go. Yeah, and that's when you think oh, it's my opportunity to be in and around the first team gone now. Um, 
but uh, luckily enough, Dave Watson took over. Uh, he was under a lot of pressure. You know, we were in a difficult situation. Um, I was on the bench and I didn't think I was going to come on that day. You know, I didn't think I was going to be a part of it. Um, but moments happen in football and um, Teddy Fielding at the time, yeah. he, he went down with a bit of a nasty injury by the Gladys Street and David pointed at me and told me to get ready. So yeah. all, all the sort of nerves of being a fan was always there. Yeah. there. But then as soon as you, you got the call, it was sort of game on and yeah. ready to go and just the buzz. You just, I think I ran on the pitch from the main stand um, Neville Southall had a goal kick when they yeah. made a substitution I ran on I realised I ran too far and I had to come back yeah. again <laughs> realised where, re yeah. realize where I was playing and Nev kicked the ball towards my side it went over our head and then that was it the half time whistle went Right. so I had a bit more time to reflect and yeah. sort my head out Dave Watson pulled me to one side and he he, he just said do what you do just yeah. do what you do you know what the Evertonians like you know what, what makes them tick and you know, be aggressive you know, make sure you win your battles and uh, that was in my head, and I've never been booked. I've never been sent off, and I've been pretty sharp and attackable, pretty fair. And yeah. not long after, in the second half, I thought I was stronger than Ramad Vega, and <laughs> I went through the back of him by the park end. I got a yellow card, and I was thinking I can't be getting sent off in my day. Yeah, wow! So that sort of calmed me down a little bit. But you get the cheer from the fans that I was showing a bit of aggression, and then yeah. it was an important win. We won one nil, so to make yeah. me debut against a decent side, against like players who you've been looking at and yeah. they've just played with Stephen Carr was down that side and Rule Fox and you know, they were you know they were the danger men for them down yeah. that side and to, to sort of to, to stop them and to to have a you know, a part in that game was brilliant to come off on me, David, with a one nil win. Yeah. I mean do you remember what were, were the family watching? Did they, were they Yeah, they were all there, yeah. yeah. Um that we have all been season ticket holders, you yeah. know, myself we have gone from, as I said before, main stand to um, family enclosure to the all my mates in the Gladys Street and yeah. you know what I said before when I was YTS Neville Southdoor used to try and get us to Goodison Park when it was your day off yeah after an 18 game to, to go on the pitch and warm up Neville like warming up half 11 yeah you know yeah. hours before wasn't he yeah. <laughs> and we'd do, we'd do keep you up with our shins which was a new one yeah. and Nev was brilliant at it but just to share the pitch with Nev yeah was brilliant and, and then I'll just jump over the ban the, the walls of the sponsor boards and go and get to my seat in the Gladys Street wow. after I've, I've cleaned and then probably give the players stick then as a fan yeah. <laughs> and then walk in one day as yeah. the teammates but yeah there was just to be around your heroes yeah. um, and, and, and I just had to suck it up as a sponge as much as possible what they're doing right what they're doing to add to their game and how they look after themselves what they do in training and I was just in it all really just sitting back on taking it all in yeah it's interesting what you say about Nev because obviously we spoke to Kevin Ratcliffe and Derek Mountfield uh, so far so they're very much his contemporaries aren't they but someone like yourself you're going from being like your boyhood idol and then you're playing alongside him just what was it you've mentioned there the, the dedication to the craft that's what it was all about wasn't he just the, the, the relentless training you heard all about it yeah. um, you know, the, the, he's owned Sam Pitt and he was first one in last one out and, but until you'd actually witness it yourself no matter what time you got to Belfield Nev sitting there with a cup of tea and some toast yeah. you know half six six o'clock in the morning he's there you know if we were travelling away uh, with the reserves and we had to get the, to Belfield early. Nev's already there. Yeah. You know, he was he'd, he'd done a lot of work before anyone even come to come into come into work to train. Nev yeah. Nev was there all about and he was look, he was just a main man. Everyone had a nickname, whatever Nev called you stuck for a while. I had, nice. I, I had a few. <laughs> a few I didn't like, a few yeah. that stuck when other players come, but it, it was just brilliant that he he just showed that he cared and yeah. you know you had something that he, he pushed his club forward and be a part of it. Yeah, and within I think it was about three days of making your debut, then you're playing in the Merseyside Derby, aren't you? Yeah, but Merseyside, you know, Merseyside Derbies are always nervous for for fans. You know, yeah. even getting up in the morning, and you just think about what well, the week before. To be honest, you know, he's thinking about it. But again, didn't think I was going to be a part of it. And I'm not a nervous person, but I was nervous that day sitting on the bench. Right. Um, Liverpool were doing well. I think they were pushing for the title at some point, and yeah. they were they were up there about and. Again, another incident happened on the pitch where Craig Short fell down with a, a bad fall um, and Dave pointed at me again and that was it. It was sort of, well, making, you know, well, I think it was the youngest player at the time to make Merseyside derby. So that was a, a great box ticked off and we, yeah. we got a positive result with a 1-1. Um, and you know you're, you're sort of getting, well, I just ran on the pitch and remember seeing Duncan just pointed at a certain Liverpool player and said, stop him. So uh, the nice. game, really, I didn't really get involved enough you know nice. I didn't really sort of get on the ball it wasn't it was a hit and rush Liverpool were dominating really with Steve McManaman and um, there was uh, Rob Jones was there sort of threat yeah. so 
I was stopping him and to take Rob Jones off, and I think they brought McAteer on, and okay. then we job changed again just to stop right. him. So I just cancelled out and done my bit. You yeah. know, didn't do any extra. Um, left a few nasty tackles on on Jason, yeah. which he told me afterwards, which right. is uh, good. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know it's just come come natural to yeah. at the time. But uh, I think that stopped Liverpool going for the title. And I think Unzi and Robbie might have got sent off that game as well. So there was a, yeah. Yeah, was a typical bit, Merseyside yeah. derby that you'd expect back then. And but to uh, again. You know, positive result in my first two two games as a as a young professional it was brilliant. Yeah, and there was a great um, summer of uncertainty, wasn't it? Because I remember Peter Johnson, the chairman at the time, was promising all these big name managers. I think they were chasing Bobby Robson for most of the summer. Uh, eventually, he he didn't come, and then getting turned down by Andy Gray. And then your man, obviously uh, Howard Kendall, um, um, com- coming back in and. Um, I mean, I was just looking back at the, the you, you didn't play the first few games, but then obviously coming in for, for the, the Arsenal game, a, a huge fixture and a big impact from you. Yeah, it was. It was it was back to square one under Howard. Uh, pre-season uh, was different than it was under Joe. I think he brought Terry Field into the football club. Um, but, and, you know, um, Andy and Scuff was still there as well. But Andy was brilliant with me. We used to do extra a lot, yeah. me and Andy, and um, just work on our technique, our crossing. You know, he was... Fantastic at pinging 60, 70 yard balls right. across the pitch, and, and then obviously his famous corner kick. So, you yeah. to try and emulate them, at, you know, in training with them. And uh, under Howard, I just had to bide my time and uh, wait for my opportunity. Um, and then it was more mostly when we played Newcastle away. I come on as a yeah. as a sub. I, I'm not sure if someone got sent off, but I, co- I come on. Yeah. And Howard was uh, was really impressed how I, I managed situations. So, that was me sort of in his front mind of his yeah. thoughts then moving forward. And, um, you know, he, the Belfield famous steps at the front, he was taking the boots off and he just, he did, had another little wink, Howard. And yeah. he goes, I remember that night, yeah. you know, when, when he met me mum and dad and when the first time when I was 13, 14. Yeah. So that gave me a bit of a confidence booster yeah. that he remembered. And uh, But it was up to me to do the to the hard work. He did. He never used to pull me to one side to say I need to work on anything. It was just being around them professionals at my first sort of, say, full season to try and um, stamp my own little thing on the uh, on my performance and how I can bring to, to the football team because you, you look at the players in the around you and go yeah they're, they're senior professionals but can I do better yeah. and I've got to do better to get in so I have to bide my time but thankfully I've got my opportunity yeah I mean you mentioned see, that, that Arsenal game they ended up being league champions uh, that year and you're 2-0 down at, at Goodison and then the Mike Ball pops up in, in, in the uh, in the area with a, with a header yeah it was a mix of emotions um Howard wanted me to play centre back, which yeah. I used to do a lot for the youth yeah. team and stuff. And um, but it's the first time I'd done it, um, and a senior. And I thought I was holding my own. You know, I, I was I was playing pretty well. I was, uh, <laughs> and we were two nil down. Yeah, that was just the the quality of Arsenal. And a half time, Howard moved me then to left wing back, which wasn't my favourite position, yeah, exactly. but it was the the system as choice at the time. A lot yeah. of teams were playing wing backs and. I got moved to left. So in me, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, does he blame me for the for the goals or the opportunities? Yeah. But I think it was just his way of trying to get back into the game, and yeah. I knew what what needs to be done as a as a full back or as a, as a wing back is yeah. the balls getting the upper side, trying to make sure you're in that back post area if anything yeah. comes across. And I think it was the Teddy feeling crossed it and Graham Stewart headed it back across, and I was there in between Tony Adams and Dave Seaman to put it away and. And I ran off like I've scored the World Cup winner, I think, you know. Oh, and, why not? and then there was, yeah. uh, you know, I've just one coming over and applauding me, but then you realise it's only 2 1. You know, you've got, yeah. to, you've got to get back into the game and you're just hoping could we get something out of that game to make it memorable for scoring your first goal. And thankfully, uh, Danny, yeah. the youth team mate, come on and, and, and also got the, the equaliser. So that was a, a brilliant day for both of us. Yeah. And then um, me and Danny still talk about that now because it still comes up quite a lot of the. The two youngest seventeen-year-olds to score in in a Premier League game at the time, and I think that still stands. And um, it was a magical day for the academy, um, yeah. and obviously me and Danny personally. Yeah, and then you, you mentioned about some of the characters in there. You, you said Duncan Ferguson already, but um, Slavin Bilic was it was a big one at the time. And they, you and him used to go in together. He was. I remember you telling me a story about um, <laughs> he was going about when he lived in London and uh, how he used to be <laughs> yeah, neighbours with Elton John or something yeah, like that. Slavin was a brilliant character, yeah. um, a brilliant fella. But he, he lived local to me and yeah. didn't really like driving too much. And yeah. every so often we used to share lifts and. Maybe on one of his um, poorer days, he, he had a bit of a moan to me that once yeah. he used to live in London in a flat next door to Elton John and shopping Harrods, and now he 
he lives next door to me and he's got he, he gets asked for the ABC car from the safe way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, well, but he was a he was a player yeah. ahead of his time, you know. Yeah. He's quite clever how he played the game. Um you know, he's got a nudge, he'll go down nice. you know, under pressure to calm everything down. It wasn't sort of bit, bit frowned upon back then. Yeah. Um, but he, he that's the how he used to play the game. Uh, but the character I think Gary Speed was brilliant. You know, yeah. he, um top professional. He's looked after he looked after the youngsters really well. He he'd be asking certain things from the youngsters. Um but he he'd be plowed and he had quite a lot. And yeah. when it comes from players like him, um I wasn't a sheltered and bowler. No. He was you, you just watched him. Um and I think I've I've spoken the echo before where doesn't I think we played Wilmington or Crystal Palace, Selhurst Park and he ran past me and tackled my man. Right. Didn't yeah, say yeah, nothing. Said, yeah, and then that sort of yeah. triggered me to wake up and yeah. you know, and about my why okay, I know what I need to do now, and he didn't have to say anything. No, uh, but he he was a leader, but technically a very very good footballer as well. Yeah, well, I mean, what was what was Duncan like? T- Duncan mm-hmm. again, he, he he was your he was your hero. You know, yeah. he, he was someone that yeah the the club needed at the time, and yeah. you know, remember we got Ian Durant and Duncan, and you, you Ian Durant was fantastic yeah. for us, and you, maybe his knee, whether he's going to last in the Premier League or not. Yeah. But then when when um, Duncan become sort of the icon as he did for the Everton. Yeah. I've got a t-shirt with Duncan on him going to semi-finals with the Leeds, yeah. and then obviously we win the cup, and he, he and then share the training ground with him. He, he was quiet yeah. but aggressive when it needed to be, you yeah. know. And you, you knew when he had a big game coming up because Duncan had a a little bit of a glint in his eye, yeah. looking forward to it. And nine times out of ten, he he, he pulled out top performances and big big moments for us, and uh, just to share the changing room with him and. The stick he used to give you if you if he tried to turn you, yeah, uh, he, 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 you make sure he, he knew, yeah. <laughs> you know, to, yeah. uh, just to have them battles with, with yeah. players like that, you know, to um, your wit. Obviously, Duncan size him, you had to be a little bit cuter and clever yeah. to get the best of him at times. But you know, he, he made sure you wouldn't give you an easy ride. So yeah. you know that's part of your journey and your development. Yeah. Before we go on to that game against um, Coventry City, um, I just want to ask you: We were talking recently because obviously Everton were away in Portugal on that training trip, and you were telling me about the first time you went away with Everton there and when Howard took them away on a, a mid-season trip. And I mean, that that was actually Slavin and Duncan, wasn't it? Was, yeah. it was the story behind that. I'll let you tell that one in, in a minute. But it's an interesting one, wasn't it? Because again, you're saying, you're saying you're out there with your, your heroes, really, and it's quite intimidating, although you enjoyed it, the, the, the whole idea that you might have to get up there and do, do a bit of a turn. Yeah, I was I was very quiet in the changing room. Yeah. I, I come alive on match days, um, pretty intensive in training. But... Competitive match days is when I come alive and yeah. when I come vocal. But Monday to Friday, I'm pretty quiet, pretty shy, timid guy, especially in that dressing room with the the characters that we had. And yeah. um, the club or the FA brought a new rule where the players got sent off. The the club could find them two weeks wages. Yeah. Um, Howard took exception to that and yeah. thought we can use that money for for better things. And we we, we went away to Cyprus for a few days. Um, they weren't going through a bit. Of, we went through, went going through a good time. Yeah. Uh, he thought a break would do his wonders, and Duncan had to pay for one meal and slaving the drinks the next day, yeah. and, and just to see, as you said, the, the heroes are sort of yeah. out of the the environments that you normally see them just to relax and to to train. They work hard, they played hard. Hatton Howard had a a special thing where everyone had to stand up and sing a song, and I was absolutely yeah. dreading the moment it was going to come round to me and. Howard had his special cigars as well. Daddy, a few players used to like. I didn't okay. want to take one. And when I got told, if you want to play in the derby, you've got to take one. I took one straight wow. away. I snatched his hand off. And then I acted, obviously, trying to think of a song. Um, tried to hide in the toilet for a while. I couldn't. I tried everything that, but he had to stand up. But, you know, look, the lads, were, we've all had to go through it. It was nerve-wracking. Uh, Michael Branch was sitting next to me. He had to do it. And Michael's similar to himself, pretty shy in those yeah. situations. And... Uh, we just had to get it done quick as possible, and the players joined in, so it makes it easier. Yeah. Uh, but then when it was over, the relief to actually enjoy the rest of the trip, <laughs> yeah. and then focus on what we had to do when we come home, and we got positive results after that. So it was a, it was a team bonding session that, that went well. Yeah, but of course, I've seen it, it went to that final day. I remember how nervous I was just just, mm. just as uh, as a fan. I mean, you could go around before and. Um, Think because uh, obviously it was one to one at the time, and I think it was a Stanley Dock Market before, and someone had, had a, an Everton shirt, and they'd put a G on it, so they'd gone to one because obviously oh, yeah. first division at that time, and just was that the day maybe Brian Lebone was pounding the pavements outside Goodison as well. It's too much. I mean, did that relay much? 
back to you in the dressing room, that that, that nervousness? Or no, just... I've, I've, I've been asked this before, yeah. and it's only when I speak to, say, Don Hutchinson about it, yeah. and uh, it brings back a few memories, but I think I was just still young and naive at Everton Football Club, yeah. and we're not going down. And right. It's only if you look at a couple of results beforehand, and you look back now, you go, wow, we were in a bad situation. But I was living my dream, yeah. and I was living like what, what I wanted to do as a kid and just never thought the possibility of this football club going down and yeah. there was no pressure on me of thinking I need to save them. You know, I just thought it would never happen. Yeah. I, um, even moments in the game when it was very nervy and you know, the dark clouds come over Cuddleston yeah. Park, you know, it was just, I just had belief that would never happen. Yeah. Um, and I think it's obviously after the game when yeah. you see everyone's emotions, the, yeah. you know, the boss's emotions and, and it wasn't... Um, pleasing time for myself after the game because during the game I, I, I had a nasty challenge yeah um big student to me knee uh, and i'd like to see if anyone from the family enclosure ever witnessed that i can throw a claim in at the physio <laughs> he uh the physio had a, f a few choice words with me yeah. he said you've got a hole in your knee you're coming off the pitch and i told him you know a few a few, a few yeah. certain words and i got a clip on, yeah. i got a clip around the ear yeah. You know, he slapped me across the face. So you know, you've got to come off the football pitch, and I was, I was furious. I was really angry. Yeah. Um. I was walking down the steps, and Howard said, "What's up, lad?" And he went, "He won't let me play." And he goes, "Do you want to?" And I went, "Yeah." And he goes, "Get back on." Yeah. So I ran back on, and whether I, I infected the game or not, I do not know. It yeah. was just adrenaline, uh, pain. Um, couldn't feel anything. Um, yeah. And when we got back to the dressing room with the result the way it was, um, frankly, we stayed up. There was no celebration. It was very calm. Very sort of. And thank goodness you know, yeah. that's happened. Um, but I was sort of uh, dragged in the doctor's office and thrown up against the wall and yeah. said I put the club at risk and uh, my situation. Yeah. And you've gone against it, medical advice, but I didn't care. I mean, the yeah. result was what was mattered of what we'd done. Yeah. Um, so um, big box of painkillers and crutches it was for me to try to leave Goodison Park. So it was, uh, look, it's, you don't want to be talking about, I spoke to Barry Horn about these moments when I was a fan going to Goodison, queuing yeah. up a half ten to get in the Gladys Street and, he doesn't like talking about th these moments, but it's yeah. part of our history, unfortunately. And it's yeah. uh, it's moments that you've have experienced, which you don't hope you never experience again. Yeah, and of course, obviously the, the, the team stayed up there on goal difference, but then um, Howard went in the, and, it, and it was um, what Wal Walter Smith, and then it's, it's all change um, again for you, isn't it? Yeah, I get. Yeah, it was, it was very short space of time. I've had yeah. so many managers. You yeah. know, I, I count Joe Royal as one of my managers and yeah. mentors, and under Willie Donaghy with Jimmy Gabriel. And um, yeah, it was it was sad to see how it go. Um, but Walter come in. I was because I was injured through the summer. With me and I was I was at Belfield quite a lot, and so I knew there was a change happening. Archie yeah. Knox was walking around with a with a clipboard trying to upgrade yeah. every, every part of Belfield <laughs> as possible, and uh, we knew pre season was going to be tough, and um, I think the first day, I think Walter realised he's he's got a tough job, and we all turned up in shorts and flip flops as you normally okay. do in the middle of summer for uh, the first of July. He's come from a traditional club of Rangers where you've got to wear a shirt and tie and a suit. Right. So that drastically changed, and we all had to go shopping and find some suits. You're getting a suit again. <laughs> <laughs> you had to get a suit again. <laughs> and then, uh, so yeah, so the standards went up then yeah. from just looking after yourself. You know, normal working class people go to go to work nine to five wearing suits. So. That's how they do it in Rangers, and we're doing the same. It relaxed a little bit, yeah. to, you know, as as it got on. But that's how Walter got the sort of the levels up. The uh, training was brilliant, yeah. very hard. Um, Archie had a a big black book of every session. I would never really change and go yeah. off it. You know, when you're hoping for a bit of a day off or yeah. a, a second session out, now Archie knew we had work to do. And but there was a bit of a shame because of a lot of the players that we brought to the football club. Belfield wasn't big enough. So right. my dream from Belfield when we first when I first started at Belfield as a YTS, you were in a say the A team or B team dressing room with the YTS as well, and then I got promoted say to the first team, and yeah. you're sharing the changing room with your heroes, and you're being a part of the the sort of banter or hiding in the corner listening yeah. to the banter, and and I know what's going on as the first team, but it's because it was so small. Yeah. You know, Archie basically told players it was under twenty one, put your hand up, and we had to sort of go back to oh, the old wow. dressing room. So it was. Um, Disappointing because you're not really involved at all. But then I was sort of quite glad because I'm back with all my mates again, and yeah. uh, and that was a fantastic set. Of, you know, they won the um, the youth cup. Yeah, and... you know, and I feel a bit sorry that they never got more of an opportunity to have a go. A few of us did, you know, obviously Danny and Donny. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a few more maybe could have got a bit more opportunity. But 
um, new faces and um, were coming to the football club. So sort of stopped the development of that youth team. You know, yeah. Gavin McCann left and Richard left not for long after. And uh, so it was a, sad to see some of your mates start leaving the football club, but then you start sharing the changing rooms or training sessions with players like John Collins and, yeah. you know, and um, the players are coming in, but they've all had big careers, like yeah. what you've watched on the TV. And so you're, you're looking at them and seeing what, what they're up to and, I used to love when we got new signers. I remember Nick Barnby's first training session. Yeah. That was under a uh, different manager. But, yeah. you know, I, I gave Nick a few good little kicks. But Nick yeah. was not afraid to give me some back. The no. elbows were out there. And the aggression was there. And I was thinking, if you come into this football club, you've, you know, you, you've got to try and get the better than me type yeah. attitude. And yeah. it was, um, it, I loved putting battles like that. And so yeah. every time new faces come in, you know, even no matter who they were, what name it was in the back, I made sure they had a bit of a tough train, training session on the yeah. first day. yeah. And that first season, I was going to ask you about um, the penalties because obviously you scored the penalty against Newcastle that night, the, the infamous night that Duncan was being sold to Newcastle United, who, who you're playing against. Just ask me about the penalties because other than that um, that header right at the start, um, your first goal for the club, they were all penalties. And one was penalty rebound, wasn't it? Um, mm. Manchester City. So, what was your technique when it came to penalties? Did you, did you always put um, the side before, and how did you go, go about it? It was England, really. Uh, going away with England a lot, I was the penalty taker for majority of my England career as a youth level. Yeah. Um, and the goalkeeper coach um, was the Arsenal goalkeeper coach, and he told me how David Seaman would go about his um, reading the players' minds okay. and where they would go with, with their arms. So if the arms were up, they're yeah. going across the body. If the arm's down, they're going the other yeah. side. And I thought that was a bit too easy, so I used to just do the opposite. So then that's oh, why nice. I got picked up being the, the England goal, uh, England penalty taker. And the only time it comes to be mad at Everton was the Coventry game. Yeah, and I was thinking, and obviously wasn't in the position to do it, but I was hope because I didn't think we really had a penalty taker back then. And I was thinking, yeah, I'd like to take that. Obviously, Nick took it. And, Maybe you should have done Yeah, but, you know, but, you know who knows? But, yeah. you know, it was in my mind, that should I go and get that? Um, but Nick took it and, you know, it happens. You can miss penalties. And um, um, the one I did miss at Newcastle, that is still back. Uh, sorry, I mentioned to City. That still baffles me to this day because yeah. the keeper who saved it was my England goalkeeper coach, uh, teammate, who I'll... Nicky Weaver, Nicky Weaver, which yeah. I told Nicky when I when I t used to practice my penalties, I told the goalkeepers where I'm going and cheat so I can get the power and the accuracy. Yeah. And I used to like going to the keeper's right and I could fire it in, and he didn't care if I missed in training, but it was just to get me my distances right and, me, and the angles right, and and just do you know 10, 15 penalties, and then yeah. that was Thursday, and then I'm playing against him at the weekend, and I've gone the other way. Yeah. And then he obviously went the other way, saved it. But then I tapped the ball with my right foot in the Gladys Street, which was never a dream. Yeah. Scoring with my right foot in the Gladys Street, but it was my first goal in the Gladys Street. So yeah. I was taking it. And I, I pulled Nicky after and said, why did you go that way? And he goes, I don't know. Yeah. So it was me, yeah. my mind over matter, really. Got to the best, got the best of me um, yeah. for just the goal issue reunion. I'm thinking too much into it. So yeah. that was disappointing the miss, but then made up a score uh, with my right foot. And it just come naturally. Um, yeah. Obviously, Unzi was the penalty king at the club. Yeah. Um, so it was maybe when he wasn't playing or I had the opportunity to yeah. to, you know, to step up to the plate. And, and we didn't really speak about it, me and Unzi. It was sort of like if you know if Unzi missed, I'll take the next one. Okay. If I'm on the pitch, I'll take it. And um, and that's sort of how it sort of progressed nat uh, naturally. Yeah. The manager never really, never really said anything. And I, I was, you know, I'd loved that competition of me against you, like a boxer. It's the only yeah. time, it was a team game, but... I get your wits against the goalkeepers. And it was uh, it was it was good. I used to love love that competition. Yeah. So it was ne not never an, an unseemly squabbles over who was going to take it. Or anything no, like, there was that, never that, like that. No, no. no yeah. It was always it was always you know we went, we went to penalties. You see the ones who used to step up and yeah. the majority of the time was the youngsters. A lot of the youngsters lads would you know, they'd back themselves to step up to take the penalties. And you know, it was, I think as you get older, you maybe you start thinking of the. Um, the consequences, what happens yeah. if you miss? So I think that the, the wiser head stepped away, and you know the ones who had no fear stepped up to the plate. Yeah, so it's just that f that first season on on the wall, so kind of doing a, a little bit better, but then it starts to look a bit sort of dodgy um, come Easter time, and then that's, you get Ke Kevin Campbell came in, and what, what an incredible run um, that was! I mean, I mean do, do you remember much about that particular period? And then what we we do like? we, we 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 were doing pretty well, and then we yeah. just, we just had a really bad bad section of the season where we just yeah. couldn't pick up results um, I used to speak to Walter in the office quite a lot I'd be away with England on Thursday nights with either England 18s or 21s and 
you know, I was I wasn't trading that much. Yeah. Um, he was trying to wrap me in cotton wool as much as possible, uh, Walter, and, and asked me to st- ask more from me. Mm-hmm. Um, he goes, "You're not a young player anymore. You nice. know, you, you can, you're one of our key players, and so I want you to demand more from your teammates." And and then we he brought in two youngsters um, from I think they were from Spain or Italy on, on trial, and we've had sort of the older players come in and haven't really hit the ground running. Yeah. And then when Kev Campbell come. You know, I remember watching Kev on, on the TV, training on his own, and you're thinking, yeah. not another one. You know, we, yeah. we, we need someone who's going to save this football club. And, you know, he hadn't done it for a couple of years. And and we had these two lads on, on trial for a week or two weeks. And th- as I said before, I used to put me, me own wits against these yeah. these guys when they come in and they could difficult, but they, they ran riot. Really? And, and I was thinking, well, I hope we sign these two. These, these look uh, dangerous. These can cause some problems. And uh, Kev come for a day. And we signed Kev, yeah. and you're thinking, mm, you know, can't really see the light at the end of the tunnel here. Yeah. But then, match day comes, and he's a different animal. Yeah, you know, Mark Hughes was the same. You know, training, yeah. you know, you didn't see anything from Mark Hughes. Right. But match day, they do what they do. Yeah, you know, they save themselves for match day, and and history proves itself. What Kevin did. Yeah, you know, he was in the right place, at the right time. He had the the ability to find the net. Yeah. He was great with the youngsters. He was a great character. He was happy go lucky. Yeah. We were in a dark period. Mm-hmm. He always had a smile on his face, and he sort of took that sort of belief from him, yeah. who's who's done it. You know, he wasn't sort of turning up to the club of his sort of last paycheck. No, he had a sort of job to do, and mm-hmm. and knew he could pass down his experience, which he did. So, the, the, you know, a mixture of a of a football team that we had you know, yeah. with, with Franny Jeffers. He had a fantastic link up with Franny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, he was just a shining star, which I didn't see was going to happen, but thankfully. Yeah. He, he he chose Everton because he did have a lot of choices. Yeah, uh, and and he saved his football club with his performances. Yeah, and obviously uh, early in the, the next season. Now, thankfully, obviously they, they've done it once during COVID, gone and won at Anfield again. But it <laughs> remains the last time in front of fans. I know this is um, Goodison Park, my home, but I've got yeah. to ask you about that particular particular game. I mean, uh, what was was that like at uh, Anfield winning there? They were obviously always. Brilliant battles for me. Once yeah. you, the first thing the time the fixture list comes out, I look for those two yeah. fixtures. And um, yeah, the record at Anfield hasn't been too too good. You know, we've had good performances sometimes yeah. and haven't got the results. And we've got the draws there. We've been unlucky so many times with referee decisions here and there. And yeah. But to finally get over the line with like, Kev's goal and it come off sort of me long, short throwing, that went <laughs> a bit too far. Um, it was hard to read for the, for yeah. my strikers, so, but it was a, it looked like a well worked goal when it went over uh, Duncan's head to yeah. Nick Madaru laid off uh, for that Duncan for that's one of the, the derby goals, but for Kev's goal yeah. it was, was was sort of similar, um, but a little bit shorter, got cleared, but yeah. Kev found that net and to celebrate in the uh, in the dressing room afterwards, with the delight of the players, you can see it, it meant a lot to them as well mm-hmm. as myself being local. I yeah. knew that was a you know a big result and and, and something that we can sort of hold on to for the rest of the season. Yeah, and I remember um, when Walter Smith passed, you were up there at, 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 at the, um, the the service. But I mean, it was obviously it was a it's an up and down relationship for you, and that and also you signed a few players in in your position. You obviously had the, the injuries as well. I mean, what what was that like in when, when he was doing stuff like that? Was it tough? It was it was tough, yeah, um, but enjoyable. You know the challenge. Yeah, yeah I think Richard Goff comes to the football club. I thought he was brilliant. He probably yeah. changed my mindset a little bit, Goffy. Of um, yeah, as I said before, players were coming in and probably weren't gaining respect he'd expected. You know, mm-hmm. from these type of players. But Goffy was just an instant success. As soon as yeah. he comes to the football club, yes, he was well known for under Walton and the new. If anything, we said to Richard, might go back to the gaffer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was all for the right reasons. It yeah. was hundred percent professional. He, he spent a lot of time with myself and the youngsters, and uh, how to go about certain things. I might um, shout and scream and have the aggression, mm. saying the right things, but how I was saying it was probably over the line a little bit. And uh, Goffy just had a way of sort of teaching me the best way to get the best out of your own teammate at times, yeah. and. Uh, help us, the whole team as morale. Not just about himself personally, because a lot of time Richard was injured. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's, him and John Collins, the professionalism that just sort of bled through the whole of us. If they're doing it at their age, we've got to start doing it. We've got to step up to the plate, especially the youngsters. Yeah. Um, yeah, but Walter, who, I was playing all over the place, you know, under Howard. I played right back, I played centre mid, centre half, left centre half, left wing back, yeah. left back. 
um, and Walter was sort of the same. Yeah. You know, Walter he he wanted to be playing left back, but then he'd like to have his back four or back five sometimes, back yeah. seven at <laughs> times of, of, de- of defenders. <laughs> so then you, you left yourself in 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 centre half, uh, centre midfield at yeah. times. But look, at just putting that shirt on and yeah. having that opportunity, and I just knew if whoever he brought into football club. I have, to, I have to raise my game. Yeah. So you know, if Walter is that Walter's way of, um, sort of give me a kick up with the backside. They go, we need to do more. You know, yeah. you'd never speak about it. You say, you know, you don't want to be uh, a forgotten yeah. player. You say you're a young player. You get away with mistakes when you're young. Yeah. Uh, but when you're a senior pro or a key player like you are, you need to do more. You need to get more for yourself and your teammates. And we had regular contact and, um, and it, I liked that because he showed me time. So I knew he, he liked me, but I needed to do more, you know, because I've gone from you know my twenty five shirt, yeah. So then I th- probably f- in a weird way, uh, subconsciously thought I've made it when I got me number three, yeah. Um, but then he got Pistoni, and Pistoni wanted a number three, and that got took off me yeah. to number twelve, and that hurt, yeah. Right. That really hurt because I think not the number three get taken off me. Wow, that does hurt. Who wants number twelve? <laughs> you know, yeah. Twelve. I mean, Agent East probably all yeah. right with that. Well, I, man, yeah. I, I, I didn't like that. I'd rather no. go back to number twenty-five. Say, but you know, that gets taken out of your hands because you're a youngster. Um, yeah. But I had my favorite. I had my best season. Yeah, as number twelve. You know, yeah. and uh, so it was probably his man management. So he knew yeah. how to get the best. I keep Pistoni happy. And he's yeah. new, new face. Um, new opportunity for him comes to a new football club. But then Gary Naismith come as well. Yeah. Um, we brought Unzi back. Yeah. As well. So, there was, so, you know, while I'm looking around the pitch thinking, you know, we need players in certain positions, they brought three in and around my area. Um, but that just kept competition up. And, yeah. you know, we had to battle between ourselves and somehow we, I think at some point, probably all played yeah. <laughs> in the start yeah. 11 at one point. Yeah. If you look back at the, some games, we were all involved. And, um, but yeah, it's kept on my toes. Yeah. And keep me, uh, and keep me comfy. You know, yes, you'd be a key player, but it didn't mean you, you guaranteed games. And as I said, Walter did put me, wrap me in cotton wool at times because yeah. of me, me the injury. And, and he probably thought I'm not going to get many games out of Michael if, um, yeah. if if he carries on playing for England on Thursdays and coming back playing for for the club on say Southampton on a Saturday away. There was a lot of travelling going on. It's yeah. obviously a lot better now. They do the internationals, but back then it was. It was tough, but when you're young, you you can do everything. You feel yeah. like you can do everything, but yeah. if your manager can spot your performances sort of level off or going below par, mm-hmm. you know he needs someone else for the team. So if he thought Unzi and Gary Naismith or Pistoni could could help the team do that, then that's that's his objective. So yeah. it just made a competition for me really to prove that I'm going to be the better one. Yeah, I mean you mentioned that that, that level of form that you were at back then, and obviously the, the England call up that you said there. Uh, as well, I mean, what was it? that was like? Um, obviously, Sven in, in the news recently, man, managing at Anfield, getting getting the call. Well, from I didn't him. know he was a red, so I think my thoughts on Sven <laughs> might change now. To be <laughs> yeah. honest, um, similar to me, me Everton debut, yeah. uh, the England call up because I'm. Um, I think when you're young, you, you want everything tomorrow, and um, when I was in the under twenty ones, a few times I got called up to the first team, yeah. um, Italy. Uh, away, um, I think Bulgaria on the bench under Kevin Keegan. Um, and I thought you're going to get the opportunity right. to get on there. And Ray Clements um, was warming up behind the goal. He came running down the touchline, shouting my name. Um, so I half heard it, but yeah. started doing extra stretches. Yeah, you know, thinking here's my time, here's my moment yeah. now to reflect. And then as I put my head up to to listen to what he said, he, he said, "Get Carra." <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, "I'm oh, devastated." There's my moment wow. gone. So Jamie Carragher went on, and I think. Another time, I think uh, Michael Gray went on, but I just knew it was going to come at some point. Yeah. If I keep up my performance up, this the opportunity to play for England will happen. But then, you know, just three three times I've been in the squad, or t- twice I've been in the squad with two different managers. And then Sven's first time, yeah, I was feeding the ducks. Um, and uh, Alan Myers, as we all know, he gave yeah. me the phone call to say I was in the squad. I just put the phone down because I didn't think. <laughs> <Both mucking about. laughs> yeah, so Alan's off to one of his tricks again. Yeah. And he went, no, seriously, you're going to get named in the uh, in the senior squad. Yeah. I went, right, okay. And then I was just hoping that this would be time. Hopefully I get me moment to, to yeah. finally get an England cap. And um, thank you for saying he gave me that opportunity. Didn't start, Chris, Chris Powell started. Yeah. But it was, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'm a youngster. Hopefully I should be the future of England. Yeah. That's what, how you're dreaming. Um, but yeah, look, to wear, that, to wear, to wear the three lines as yeah. on, in, in every age level, that was the, the one missing for me. Yeah. So yeah, that was, it was brilliant. Yeah, what was what was Sven like? What did he say to you? Yeah, do you remember? 
No, it, it was training. Yeah. Um, similar to the City days, I was very quiet. Yeah. You know, it was my first time I've, I've had a fodden manager, really, I suppose, yeah. who was very quiet and we just do a shadow play. And um, he did say, look, you're coming on second half, so make yeah. sure you're ready. So I think I remember warming up a lot sharper than what you'd normally yeah. do at half time. I think uh, me and Frank Lampard, there was a lot of changes, but we yeah. were um, warming up a bit more aggressively, playing against the top side, Spain. And yeah. to, to come off that pitch, it wasn't at Wembley, unfortunately, it was at yeah. Villa Park. Yeah. But it was, um, yeah, to, you know, I think it was, a, I think we were drawing half time. Yeah. And then we, we ended up winning the game 3 1. So it was, uh, it's good to be a part of it. Playing Michael Owen, really, he should have scored in my first couple of touches. Yeah. I'd done a one two and I put the ball over to Michael. Um, and I, he tried to lob the keeper, and unfortunately, he just didn't hit the back of the net. So that could have been maybe yeah. an extra boost. But yeah, yeah it was just great to be to share the pitch with those players and, and to get me England cap was brilliant. Yeah. So on the back of all that, obviously, like you said, when you're arguably your best season at Everton, and then obviously the heartbreak for you as Ever, Evertonian to be to be told that the club have accepted an offer for you. I mean, how, how did that all pa pan out in terms of a, the, your departure? Just out the blue, yeah. Really, I think everyone out on the outside seemed to think of it. My, my, yeah. my dad's friends and my friends used to say, "What's going on?" And yeah. um, I heard nothing else. I was away on holiday, you know, um, picking up Player of the Year awards. I picked it up and said, "I'll see you next year." Yeah. You know, and, you know, can't wait to get the season going. You know, so my thoughts would get back to pre-season and, and um, be a blue, and that's what happened. Start of pre-season, um, I was still. In and out of the the first team sort of training sessions with me, knee with me injuries. So I was with the physios a lot with the team in and out of warm ups and stuff. But I'm just thinking about getting myself ready for the first game of the season. And then all of a sudden, you know, Trevor Stephen was my agent at the time, and yeah. he said they've accepted offers from Liverpool, Middlesbrough, and, and Rangers. You know what? And what Walter, which I said, we we used to speak quite a lot. Yeah, didn't you know, didn't pull me to the offers. Didn't say anything. Um. But before then, I was away on holiday to come home to sign a new contract. Yeah. Um, and got to Goodison, uh, say on a Tuesday or Wednesday, cut my holiday short. And when I got to the park home reception, the the reception didn't know why I was there or what why yeah. <laughs> the reason why I was there. And when I explained, she she went away and come back, and I got the call that the um, the board have changed their mind. Unfortunately, um, yeah. so that put me angrier to go to yeah. pre season to to to, to show. You know, I deserve a contract. I want to stay here. Yeah. So I was, but unfortunately, because of my knee situation, I couldn't be a part of it. So, and, and that was really, really frustrating. You, yeah. you just wanted to prove a point to Walter Smith, or whether it was Walter's decision or whether it was the board's decision. I, I still, to this day, yeah. don't know. Um, but the way it, it all transpired is, I went up to to Rangers for for a weekend to, to see Trevor and and then met Rangers. Steve McLaren was the manager at Middlesbrough. Obviously, yeah. the going across the park was never going to happen. Yeah, you know. Um, you know, and, and it, it was just they started showing me the love that I was probably craving a little bit from yeah. from from the club, not just the manager. The manager, you know, I wasn't too fussed whether Walter loved me or liked me. Yeah. You know, I just knew he was my manager. It was sort of the way David Murray sort of um, wanted to have the ambition of what Rangers wanted to do: play Champions League football. They wanted to bring more players to the football club, and I thought, yeah, it's all great. And then went home hoping that Everton might change their mind or yeah. something. Because my medical went on for a good two and a half weeks right? because of my knee situation. And you're just hoping in that moment Everton might, you know, change their mind and say, yeah. look, yeah, we'll be a part of it. But Walter did say, look, he, um, as it got further down the line, that if you come back at this football club, you want to be playing for the World Cup, yeah, you'll be rotting in the reserves if you start wearing this shirt again. So that was sort of a dagger in my heart. Yeah. Um, so I knew there was no comeback. There yeah. was no point of me, if I wanted to chase my dreams of going to the World Cup, being at Everton was an option, unfortunately. Yeah. And um, I had to pick between Steve McLaren um, or Dick Advocat at Rangers, really, yeah. to see who can say that journey. And a lot of the Howard Wilkinson, the Peter Taylor, um, a lot of England coaches who were being mentoring me a lot, were, were giving me, you know, while I've been at Everton, yes, you've had your best season and you've done well and play of the year, but the edginess of you going forward and the aggression of it going forward has been sort of stifled a little bit with the start of play and to yeah. get back into the England fold, you need to play for the forward thinking team again and yeah. and you have all the, the noise and coming to your ears but you, you, at the end of the day you just don't want to leave Everton yeah. you know and um, I think I spoke to Preno the day I left I had yeah. to go back to Belfield to pick up my bits and uh, you know I just broke down I didn't know what to say or what to do it's just um, your dream's gone Yeah, you know but then it's sort of 
that door closes and then you've got to focus on your career then of what you need to do for you, for, for yourself. And while it's sort of selfish, it's still, still here to this day, but yeah. it was a uh, come back home. Then you're, you're back with your mates then watching Everton when you had the yeah. opportunity, yeah. you're back with your season tickets with your mates and you're following the blues as a fan. Yeah. Then wishing you were on that pitch with yeah. that shirt, but you know, it, it happens part of football. Yeah. You don't get, it's not all ups. You know, you, yeah. you do get downs and, Unfortunately, that was a, you know, a sad part of my career. Yeah. I mean, it's just certain naivety, I guess, we've got as fans and include journalists in that as well. Because you think, oh, I play for Everton. No, I'll be at Everton forever. And I mean, that, 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 that was your dream. But then when you're told that, and especially when you're told they've accepted an offer from Liverpool, because it's only a year after Nick barnby has gone to Liverpool. And now, you know, they're not going to like throw Michael Ball under the bus. Yeah, it was, it was, it was heartening. Um, you know, a pan Liverpool have been in three times before then, which I, I only found out after the event. Um, yeah. And that was, you wonder why Gerard Hooley was at a lot of England games, you know, under 18 and 21s. He was in around yeah. the, the English FA a lot. And that's probably those reasons. Um, obviously, playing with Michael and Stephen Gerrard and, and Carrigan under 21s, a, a lot of Liverpool. So going away with England was very difficult for me with a big connection to Liverpool, big connection to Manchester United. And sitting at the wrong table at lunchtime could yeah. be <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was only Fran, obviously Francis, Franny Jeffers got into the England fold. You, you had a bit of a teammate from back home of your club, and yeah. they used to ask you questions. I was training, and what do you do in training? And that it was, it was a little bit different than what we used to do yeah, right. a lot. So, but I was used to that for, for as a youngster. So it was easy for me to to, to gel that part of it. You know, players like say Danny Kadamatri when he was part of the England fold. I think he probably struggled yeah. to say it in sessions because it was brand new to him. It was different. Um, but yeah. It, when you get told you, you, your time's up, and and the media, the fans, my mates were giving me stick, you yeah. know, and they knew half the truth, you know. Me, one of my friends had the the facts from Liverpool of what the contract offer was going to be, and <laughs> you know, and I'm going, I don't, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, this is not happening. The club hasn't said anything to me, but but when it finally does happen, it's um, they feel like say I told you so. But yeah. to me, I, I was coming back from holiday to sign a new contract and. When it got took away, it's like, yeah, it's just a dagger in your heart. And you just yeah. don't know what to do. You're in a bit of a daze, I feel, yeah. for quite a while. Um, and they, but you've got, I went to an obviously fantastic club at Rangers, but you just got to focus on trying to get over the line with that. And that medical was very lucky to go yeah. through. To be honest, I could have been an Everton player for a couple of more years if Rangers decided yeah. not yeah. to to accept. You know, because the Rangers lost out to John Hartson the year before yeah. over a a medical issue, didn't want to take the opportunity or the risk, and then obviously he went to Celtic, yeah. done really well, and I don't think they wanted to lose out on another one. Yeah. Uh, so they took the gamble with myself uh, for, yeah. for them. Um, but yeah, it was yeah, it, it's football. It, it happens a lot, but when you're a youngster, you know, it was just turning twenty one. It, it was it was difficult to take. Yeah, it's sort of difficult to take. I mean, you mentioned the the, in, the injuries there. I mean. Um, what was the, the actual the, the issue? Was it the, the, the knee, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, when I was coming through with, yeah. with Everton, Les Elm, the famous physio, you yeah. know, loved me because he, he he didn't really know me. You know, it's never great, never went yeah. in the physio's room, didn't go to the gym in there. Yeah. You know, everyone in the gym was always injured, um, and he was really impressed how I was, I was never in there. I was, yeah. I was always training every day, doing everything, but I was probably overplaying. And speaking to people now, like Wes Brown, who was at another show with me, and Michael Owen, we, we were playing a lot of football at 14. Yeah. And whether this wear and tear of that age, give up too many hours on the training field, probably, and jumping the gun of playing from 17, you know, an age group to men's football, yeah. probably sort of hampered us for that three or four years when it sort of, we all seem to have the same or similar injury right. that stopped our sort of careers, or Wes had a similar injury with his knee. Um, but I just felt the medical advice at the time or what was available at the time. You know, if it happened now, it'd probably be easily really? you know, recovered. But back yeah. then, it was a, a cortisone injection straight into the knee, which is a, yeah. a big no-no. Yeah. Um, mask your issue. Yeah. Then I, but I got player of the year, so yeah. it can't be that bad. I mean, yeah. in my mental head, I'm thinking, yes, I'm sore every day. Yeah. I'm sore in training. Um, not training at all for the good 18 months with the, with the team. But I'm playing well. I'm, I'm performing well. So yeah. it, my knee can't really be that bad. Um yeah. Then with those quarters, obviously, do um, start relaxing a little bit. Pain yeah. starts coming back. You need the second one yeah. um, to sort of get me through to the end of the season, um, which, again, I did. And uh, you, you just in the, the trust of the, the medical people in and around yeah. you. Um, and you listen to their ex, ex, experience yeah. and expertise of what they 
feels the best for your injury. Um, and I didn't think it'd be. It was when I went to Rangers. Yeah. Rangers sort of knew something was happening because I was. Whether what we scan said one things, but my body was doing everything they asked. Yeah. So um, it's only obviously Rangers found out at a later date after, fortunately, only the 12, 13 games, me, me knee finally sort yeah. of blew up, and um, thankfully for me, the the they just didn't scrimp on medical yeah. advice. They flew me straight to Colorado um, to see Richard the Stedman, yeah. to, to Richard Doctor Stedman, the best yeah. uh, knee surgeon in the world, who. They would ask me to do certain exercises, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going. I haven't flew all the way here <laughs> to do exercises, and he said, "You're fine." I said, I'm, "Trust me, I'm, I'm not." Yeah, you know, the doctor come over to me. The Rangers had a full time doctor, a uh, Dutch doctor back then, um, and he explained the issue. And so he he scanned me, and then yeah. within a few hours, he, I was booked in to get an operation the next day, and yeah. he warned me how lucky I was um, yeah. to still be playing football. So there was one strand of tendon in your patella tendon that was fresh the rest was all rotten away and yeah. it's all eating away so you were very very lucky and yeah. you know one kick one slide tackle that could have gone and it could have put you back a longer than what it was two years it took me to get back yeah. from that so i missed a lot of development a lot of frustration from rangers fans and obviously yeah. the ranger club but more importantly myself you know yeah. it's just you want to be playing football and that yeah. gets taken away from you for something that could have been probably looked after better um so when you you think about the whole story you, you and you, you get older and wiser. You feel to Devon probably have an idea of why yeah. they pulled the contract and and so, you know, but not to be a part of the conversation. Yeah. That sort of hair. It's like it's gone round you round the back a little bit. But yeah, look, it happens. You just got to take it, do what you need to do, uh, work very hard. Um, trying to settle into a new football club. We were we we're trying to go places, bringing good players, run up the board to the football club, and yeah. Tori Andrew Flo breaking transfer records and. Uh, not missing out on a, a double, missing out on a treble. You know, you're sitting on your sidelines. You want to get that opportunity. The reasons why I went up there is to to win football yeah. games, but it wasn't to stay up there for four years. It was just to get up there and you know win win trophies and and uh, excel. You know, yeah. trying to learn and develop myself and hopefully get an opportunity to come back down to the Premier League. But you know, um, after the injury, it was just an uphill battle of yeah. trying to do that. And you know, you know, besides my trophies at Rangers, where I finally won, it was. It was the player of the month in my first year, first month back in August. Um, Mikel Arteta got the young player of the month. <laughs> so it was a good little blue connection there for, yeah. in August that after two years out to win that showed that I could I could yeah. win those battles and it sort of gave me a, a, a pat on the back that I, I can still do it. Yeah. I mean, what was that? Like? Obviously, you still talk with great affection at your, your, your time at Rangers. I think I've been up there to, to Ibrox. It kind of looks like the ground that Goodison Park could have become if it had been developed. But what was it like? We obviously know about the intensity there of the, with, with Celtic and, and Rangers and it's, it's the two massive clubs. I mean, just what, what what's it like being at Rangers in that kind of environment? It was a bit of a struggle for me and especially being out. It took me a while to get me my first old fair win. But when you do... And yeah. when you witness one, it's it's magical. But it's like Goodison, you know. Me and Richard Dunn used to talk about like after the game. We said, "Do your mouth go dry?" I was like, "Yeah." And no matter how many bottles of water or Lucasade yeah. you have, you know, you come out to Z cars, which is a bit of a thrill anyway. But after about a minute into the game, your mouth's dead dry, yeah. and you're like, Oof. "And it's just the adrenaline of being a part of it all." And yeah. and, and Ibrox was similar to that, you know. Yeah. But like first wait, instead of Goodison, that was like, oh, "I need to drink over here." Yeah. I'm on the opposite side of the pitch, you know. Yeah. There was no Lucas A bottles. I had to wait to half time. Yeah. But, um, it's just that I think nervousness and the pressure and just the awe of the atmosphere of the the fans, yeah. you know, it brings it's trying to give you that extra buzz to do yeah. to do more and. Um, you know, it was it was always sort of that dry mouth yeah. situation. I always come into it, and when I went to Rangers, it was the same. But yeah. the the levels were different, yeah. the pressures were slightly different. Um, yeah, you're not playing against you know um, top teams every week. Yeah, but I I explained to me, uh, to people down here that it was like their cup final. I played for Everton in yeah. the FA Cup and being embarrassing to tram you and yeah. played in the FA Cup and League Cup against Bristol City where we should steamroll them. Yeah, but it's their cup final. Yeah. And when you're playing the lesser teams in the, in that league, it's their cup final. It's their times to shine. And back then, if you played well against Celtic and Rangers, nine times out of ten, Celtic or Rangers will buy you. So they're yeah. playing for their careers. Yeah. You know, I played against St Scott Brown a few times, and we're winning two or three nil. And he's yeah. still kicking yet. He's still elbowing yet. He's still yeah. showing that you know it's hurting him. Um, and obviously, he went on to do well for Celtic yeah. and a great captain. So you you had to be switched on. You had to be professional. 
Um, and if the players that we have are fantastic, so we sometimes we, we get scrappy results. We had, we had the quality to break it down, but mm -hmm. when Mikel comes to the football club, we played against Mikel when he played for PSG in the Champions League. We knocked him out, so there was him and Patricino playing. Uh, in that moment, we beat, beat them on penalties in the end. Uh, we should have we, we steamrolled them, really. Yeah. We beat them on pens, but Mikel's a youngster. Showed a lot of promise. He was on loan there from Barcelona. And, yeah. Um, Rangers seen that and tried to snap him up. And yeah. He he come and we had him and Barry Fergus in the midfield, yeah. which Barry was probably not too happy about because yeah. Barry everything went through Barry. He was a youngster. He was reminded of me at Everton. He was a youngster yeah. coming through, but he got given the armband to to uh, like Stephen Jenner probably at Liverpool, where uh, to give him that sort of experience to so, say, look, it's your football club. You know, you, you've got the levels. You know what the demands of this club takes, and uh, we all fed off that. Yeah. Uh, but Mikel wanted to the same as well. Mikel yeah. wanted every pass off the, the back four yeah. off me as left back. I would be saying, Mikel, go away. <laughs> you know, yeah. get up there. But they wanted to dedicate and dictate every part of the match. But then they got the best out of Mikel, but they got the best out of Barry because Barry then moved forward and scored yeah. you know, 12 to 18 goals that season. And then when Mikel left, it was a bit disappointing. And then when I seen him linked to Everton Football Club, I was pleased. Um, but thinking as he got that edge, because he was young, he was a youngster, techn technically very, very good, had a little bit of aggression. But I think when he went back to Spain, I think he found the, the man's game a bit more um, demanding, yeah. which he brought into his game when he comes to Everton, because I knew how Everton tick, how Moyes ticks. Yeah. Um, and I was just hoping the door would come back to the football club, which it was nearly did a few times on, on the day with Moyes. And it, unfortunately, it never. Um, but, but glad to see Mikel would put that blue shirt on because of his ability. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you finished back in England with Manchester City and Leicester. But before that, I just wanted to ask you, obviously, going over to, to PSV, I imagine that'd be a very different experience to, to, to Scotland there. They'd obviously, a much more uh, technical game. I mean, what was the feeling be behind that one? How did it all come about? Well, Rangers manager who signed me was Dutch. Um, Jan Wouters, who's probably famous in England for elbowing Paul Gascoigne. Yeah. And Gascoigne putting the opera mask on his face. Um, but Jan was my coach, first team coach. Um Aggressive, um, demanding, typical Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> but good. The sessions were brilliant. Um, and in that moment, I had a contract situation at Rangers, which was really frustrating um, between Everton and Rangers. Still, to this day, don't really understand how it all transcribed, really. And it's over installments. It's it installments. Yeah. And they've said, if it hits so many games, they've got to pay Everton. And I still don't think I, I, I hit that landmark, but you know, I ended up to, to, to play football. David Murray, to, to be fair to him, you know, he said, Look, I should honor this contract, but I can't afford to. And can we come to some agreement that you, you know, can you, you know, part ways with a bit of money yeah. to um, get yourself back on that pitch? Because we need you. We're chasing Celtic, we're still in the cups. You know, we, we don't want this season to go. And he brought in a couple of left backs, yeah. um, Paolo Vinoli, an Italian fella, good player. Um, Good lad, and uh, I agreed to pay four thousands every time I played uh, for Rangers, and the the manager was was over the moon. He yeah. he, he come downstairs and said, "Get them get changed." I said, "Now," <laughs> I was yeah. like, "Yeah, I was okay." So I was on the bench, yeah. and it was great to put that shirt back on and look to play. That's all you want is play football, you know. No matter what I did in training, Monday to Friday, you train like say Maradona, Pelé, even though I didn't get to them levels, but yeah. even no matter what I did, I could not be part of it for financial reasons, which was frustrating. Mm. So that agreement happened, and. Uh, Alex McLeish put me on, I think, 88, 89 minutes or something. I took a throw in, but just walking onto the pitch again, the crowd gave me a good uh, reception, which was was a good feeling for myself. Yeah, um, He won the game, and then I said to Alex McLeish afterwards, that, that throw has just cost me 4000 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, he didn't, he didn't know what I was he's talking right, about. Okay, yeah. and, uh, but we had a little smile. I said, look, it was worth every penny to just yeah. get back playing again. And, and it was the best decision I did, because from that, Day on, obviously, Paolo Vinoli basically said, Why have they signed me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, but we had a bit of a partnership. He moved further forward. Yeah. Um, we ended up winning the league on the last day, the famous day at Rangers, the helicopter Sunday, with the, yeah. the results went our way. And, yeah. you, know, you know, we had a fantastic night. So, everything from then on, you know, it, when I went to Rangers to win trophies yeah. for, for that decision alone. So, that's put me back in the, the transfer market, really, yeah. of, uh, you know, if I didn't do that I probably would have been unknown for a couple of seasons yeah. you know when um, we played Champions League uh, qualifiers and um, um, PSV had a f 
very successful Champions League run the year before. Yeah. You know, the unfortunately AC Milan on the away goals put AC Milan through to play Liverpool in the famous two thousand and five yeah. and that PSV team was very strong, but they sold their left back to, to Tottenham and our goalkeeper was a PSV legend that ranged at the time, Ronald Rataroos, and yeah. he said, Have a look at Michael. So the yeah. scrawled the DVDs, the yeah. the Ashian Balters about myself yeah. and all of a sudden I'm going to Birmingham to talks right. for for a year and then on the way to the airport, because I think phones you up, <laughs> you're diverting, you yeah, know, yeah. and uh, and he says all the right things. Yeah. What I wanted to develop you. Look, you're coming to, to Holland, um, you had a development league, but you're still young. I can get you back in the England team. He's saying all the right things. Champions League, we need you. Um, can you get here in time? Mm -hmm. And somehow, I've signed for PSV. Yeah. I'm over uh, after leaving the home, thinking I was going to Birmingham and being back home in, yeah. in England. And um, But yeah, that was a fantastic club. S similar to Rangers of how expectations, how yeah. to play football, um, how to win. You, yeah. you know, they got to play football the right way, total football. Yeah. But um it was more. It was obviously a smaller club, um, family orientated. It was open to your family. It was open to fans every day. Yeah, people come for coffees and right. it's very relaxed, um, but very simple, you know. And of course, I think it was very, um, very clever. Everything was Dutch. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, all the team talks was Dutch and expectations of listing teams who you're going to be playing. You were winning by X amount of goals, and this is what we need yeah. to do. Um, but then you you go round one by one individually to myself yeah to the a lot of the south americans that we had so runa kone signed the same time yeah. as me um another blue yeah. and they had alex who went to chelsea yeah. uh, gomez um who went to tottenham the goalkeeper um and then obviously clive came back and uh, but phila koku was our captain the barcelona yeah. legend and we just had a fantastic side and yeah. you know we ran away with the league and it was great to win back-to-back -back league league trophies and of course they didn't end up leaving um Unfortunately, that that summer and Ronald Kuma come in the second year, nice. and that's when another blue Ronald, or <laughs> do we call Ronald the blue? <laughs> uh, Not on his Christmas tree. No, no <laughs> that's when it all changed for me. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, he brought in uh, a left back from Mexico, um, and he he signed Jan Belters from yeah. Rangers to come and join him as an assistant. So I was over the moon. Yeah, you know, Jan back, knew how yeah. to tick, knew yeah. how I ticked, and vice versa. And so I thought it was going to be. You know, another good successful season yeah. with me, but um, we were all got given the weekend off and then mm -hmm. come back on the Monday and um, there's a bit of a uh, ice or the pitches were frozen and, and right. he asked me to go and play uh, an indoor game um, after the weekend off. So I spoke to Jan and said, "Look, you know I can't play on four G. This the surgeons told me yeah. not to play on four G. I can't do that." And he goes, "Yeah, I know." Um, I go and speak to him. And I got pulled in the office and he went, you've got to play. And I said, well, I'm not putting my career on the yeah. line just for this friendly game. I'm yeah. sorry. And that's the only time I've really stood up to a manager yeah. to say, look, I've done this before. Yeah. And that's why I'm successful now because I'm managing my body and managing my knee. Um, didn't like it. Um, and then I got, I don't know, what was it called? I got acid, as we probably yeah. all know. And from then is sort of couldn't train with the first team. Yeah. Um, it was in the dressing room for a while. Koku was trying to convince Ronald to change his change his mind, but no, he, he he was stubborn, and he didn't say good morning, didn't didn't look at you. Um, so it was a long, and the transfer window was only just closed. Yeah. So it was a long six months for me. Um, New Marnie yeah, yeah. So there was you know you know we looking back at Ronald Koeman, he's done, he hasn't done it just just for me and yeah. Omar Nias, He's done it to Suarez. He's done yeah. it to some top players, but just to have that. You, you could speak to me in a better way than that to go, yeah. look, you know, you're not going to be past me plans. Let's see if we can get you to the club and move on. Yeah. Fair enough. But not just the way you went about it was, I thought it was sort of anti English. I had that sort of anti English thing. Yeah. I thought he, 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 was, he was prying on and, yeah, it just lost total respect. And I think the players, the PSV, lost a lot of respect for them, how he, right. how he handled it. They, they were all great with me. Um, but, you know, they made it as much as home as they could, but they had a job to do. They yeah. had to still go and try and win a title and they were they were pretty flying early on so I yeah. felt left out a lot yeah. um, but that all went a bit pear shaped and yeah. um, they lost a big lead in the uh, in the title and Koku come to the rescue I think they were 13 points clear and right. they're going to the last game of the season they were third right. and 
they won 5 1 with a last minute goal for the Koku and they ended up winning the league. So nice. it made up for my teammates, yeah. uh, made up for PSV and the fans because they deserved it. Yeah. Um, but then it was the same they all knew Kuma would be leaving. Yeah. Uh, and I was hoping, what well, could I sort of outlast them a little bit? Yeah. But in that January uh, window, the call come for Manchester City and I just jumped ship straight away. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I had that unrest at Rangers where you can't play football for financial reasons. This was a manager's decision, which yeah. is, that's his choice, but not playing football is the worst thing. And I'm, yeah. I want to develop, I want to improve. That's why I went there. Yeah. Um, I've learned a lot. I learned a lot how, yeah, how PSV cool. went about the technical side of things. And we went back to Manchester City under Stuart Pearce, yeah. a, a fellow left back and, he gave me the opportunity. I started yeah. off pretty brightly there. I uh, got an early goal. Um, and he started doing a few Dutch sessions. And how we went about it at City, compared to back at PSV, was a total liar opener. Okay. So, yeah, so yeah. I had to explain <laughs> certain yeah. situations in yeah. the way I, I did. And it took them quite a while to sort of understand. It standing still is quite a hard thing to do in football. Yeah. It wasn't like a cat and mouse, which yeah. sort it was. And it was a bit of an unrest. City was everywhere. But it was for me back at Premier League, back at home, give me a chance to just focus on football. And um, you know, I had the experience of, of Everton, the relegation battles. We got ourselves pretty safe. Um, so that was a sort of a tick. But it was only a loan to the end of the season. Yeah. And I, um, I was chasing a contract. I was trying to show sure want to be there. Manager changes. Um, and Sven Gordon Eggson comes in. And it didn't look like I was going to be part of his plans because okay. he went on numbers, he went on minutes, he went on games. Yeah. I only come the end of Feb uh, end of January, and he's thinking you've only played twelve or thirteen games, and, and then I explained yeah. I only signed in January. <laughs> that opened his eyes up, and he said, "Thank, well, thank goodness, and yeah, yeah you, you can start pre season, and if you do well, we'll give you a new contract." And yeah. um, because of my knee situation, yeah. it was only a small one, um, and that was brilliant under Sven. You know, he, he brought in a lot. He come in late, um, and a, a seven to nine players. I think he bought within a 10 day window. Um, training was good, um, levels went up, got more professional. Um, but we started the season really, really good up there around about Christmas. I think we were top, second, third in, in the league. We were up there, unfortunately, after the Christmas period. I put it down to the Fodners that we went down. It, it was not the Fodners were brilliant. Yeah, they, 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 Pet, Martin Petroff in front of me was fantastic. Yeah. You know, I let him just stay up and cheat a little bit and get us up the field because he was our match winners. Yeah. Alana was a match winner. Um, and we had a, a span of youth yeah. in there as well. But you know, it was a bit Sturridge, Michael Johnson, Stephen Ireland, Nader Manua. Obviously, Richard was there as well. Uh, Amika Richards, but we Sven brought in his. His extra players. I mean, he just had a fantastic balance. But yeah. these players, match winners, have never played in the Premier League over Christmas. Yeah, you know they were. As I was saying earlier, I went to away with England under 18s, 21s on a Thursday. These are flying to Brazil. Yeah, you know, Giovanni and Alana were going to Brazil on a Thursday, playing whoever they're playing in South America, flying back to play for us on the Saturday, and we're yeah. expecting them to be ten out of ten. Um, and I think to catch up at those games caught up to us and we yeah. started drifting down the, the table near the end but you know we, we got Europe yeah. at the end of the day um, not where we wanted to be no. but it was uh, it was great for Sven uh, great for the, the fans for the journey they've been on yeah. but for us as well but unfortunately uh, Sven got we knew Sven was going to be leaving the football club and it yeah. was back to square one again where yeah. a new manager comes in another ex-blue Mark Hughes and yeah. Says the same thing again. Pre season, show me what you're all about, and I'll give you the contract. <laughs> yeah. So I was just chasing contract after yeah. contract, but I loved it all. It was a fantastic career. You know, yeah, I'd love to have done more, love to have won more, love to have won trophies with the Blues, but yeah, yeah you know, it's just playing the game that you love as a hobby. Yeah. You know, you don't think about all the, the outside noise as a, as a youngster. You're just kicking the ball against the fence and in your garden for hours and ends, just hoping you could do that for one day. So luckily yeah. for myself, I did. Yeah, I mean, it's just come full circle. I mean, the, the grand scheme of things, I mean, it's, it's a short career. I mean, it's a short, even short career if you've got injuries, but it's always a short career. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I know, back to where you started in, in terms of uh, bit, being a blue on, the, on, on those um, Goodison Park terrace, terraces. It, it, it is now, yeah. like, I'm mean, well, trying to enjoy it, you yeah. know, but it, it's, yeah. I just love going. Like, the club have always been brilliant with me when I came back when I was playing for other teams and. Yeah. You know, my family is always a spare ticket here and there to, to to watch the Blues. The odd ones, one occasion, but finally when I hung the boots up, it was trying to get my season ticket sorted for my little youngster. And 
you know, and, and bring him. I say, say my nephew uh, yeah. and my young lad um, to the game every week, and it's doing what my dad used to do, and yeah. just now just going as a fan, and obviously as a commoners for the for the echo, you, yeah. you've got to try to be professional at times. <laughs> but yeah. in my head, I'm just there as a fan and just yeah. you know, living the sort of the dream I've had. I played on that pitch and yeah. and given the the experience to, to to my little lad of what what I used to do, but just go there as a fan, just sit with the fans, and just take take everything in. And go to some park is my home. It's 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 it was a dream to watch that as a kid. Yeah. Of how successful we were. Yes, as a player, it wasn't when I wanted it to be, but it was. It's still part of my history and my, and my dream. So when it does finally go, I'll be sad. But it, yeah, the the new Brandy Moore looks so impressive that yeah. you know I can't wait to go inside and have a have a nose. But yeah. you know, to take me lad there and hope for some for, for more success for, for Everton Football Club. Yeah, just finally. What what do you think you've missed m- most about Goodison then? Got to be the the wooden, it's got to be the wooden seats, hasn't it? Yeah. You know, I think post B was probably man of the match back in my day. <laughs> after, but yeah, it's, I think it's it, it, it's just the atmosphere. You yeah. know, we always talk about under the lights of Goodison because we just seem to perform better as a player. Yeah. I've always liked playing at night time. You do seem to have more energy, obviously, because you have a bit of a sleep in the afternoon, yeah. I suppose. That's why you say you're, you're full of beans, but you just seem to can run and run forever for, for one reason or another at night games. and yeah, it's just the whole occasion now. Yeah. And, you know, I think now witness it with my, with my kids and my family, uh, my sisters, and going the game of just the experience of going going in the round, Goodison before the game, and going in, and you, you're just talking about them. who's going to be the line up, you're moaning if whoever the manager picks yeah. is always a talking point. You, you'd have a, your own opinion after the game, but it's just there that you just hope this, this team and this club can start pushing up the table. and. and yeah. They're going to need every bit of help from ourselves as, as a fan base. And we've had a tired of time lately, um, but we've just we'll, we'll, we'll be there if whoever the owner is, whoever yeah, the manager is, we're all going to be there pushing yeah. for success. So, well, thank you so much, Michael Ball. Well, thanks, Chris. Cheers. <laughs>